Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 40. 40? So desperately old. Oh, our little podcast is 40. Yay. I'm quite amazed that we've actually got this far. (laughs) You say this every time. I am. I'm always amazed. (laughs) To be fair, when we started this, we were kind of sitting around going, oh, there won't be that many stories. You know, there'll be, oh, we'll run out, won't we, at 20. And who would have known that so (laughs) many people (laughs) like to poison the shit out of each other? (laughs) Well, we're glad they do. And glad they listen to us and get tips. Long may it continue. (laughs) No, that's not the Probably not. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. All right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right. Yeah. Just moving, Move, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got, you got a lot of things going on down, uh, down the docks. Always, <laughs> always got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. Um. That's, that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a good week? Oh, I've had an all right week. Good, it's good. been perfectly average. So it's, it's been a week. It's been a week. Uh, any poisonings this week, Nick? Uh, no. Potentially in this episode. Oh, what? So we shall <laughs> find out, <laughs> shan't we? Even though this is being recorded remotely through Zoom, Nick just did the scariest eyes over the camera and I generally felt a chill <laughs> run down me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that, that bodes yes, well. Yes, um, it does. Um, yay. It's going to be fun. I, th- I think while I still have time, I think it's time for us to uh, thank our delicious, lovely, sexy new Patreon subscribers. We should, that we should. They are delightfully marvellous people. So thank you so much to, uh, to Taya Couture. To Jean Russell. And Laura Cameron. You are all desperately lovely. Very, very sexy. Very nice people. And also, thank you to those who joined us on Saturday for our sort of face- Facebook, no, Instagram. <laughs> Facebook, get with the time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I'm so old fashioned, me and my Facebooks. Our Instagram live story. That was so much fun. Thank you, everyone who joined us. It was great. We, we, we genuinely thought, oh, we'll do half an hour. Two hours later, I have to say, we're what, still coming at it. What wasn't fun? was the Sunday after. (laughs) Because why? Because I had drank quite a few cocktails. The thing is, when you (laughs) pre-mix, you make a batch. When you do that, I think genius. I thought so clever, so organised. I was sitting here, had a pre-mixed batch of Martinez on the go, had some ice ready for stirring, drank the lot. My God, I was wrecked. (laughs) The good thing was, is that on the chat, you were in top four, so it was fine. It wasn't, it, it didn't turn into an incident in a class. After that, it was like, <laughs> You did text me at one point later on and went, I've got toast. And I was like, <laughs> just like a series of messages going, oh, that I didn't hear from you for about a good day. Time for all. <laughs> It was delightful. I'm at that stage where hangovers actually take me like a week to get over. I'm I'm quite glad that I haven't really had a terrible hangover for quite some time. And I think I have to thank lockdown and the pandemic for that because we haven't been <laughs> able to meet and go and just get wrecked like we normally do or sit around the house and, and you make... Like we normally do. You Such assertions you make. It's not like we go out and go to Weatherspoons and our caning <laughs> cans of Stella. I do that when you're asleep. But when we go around to your house after, as we told the few who were with us on Saturday, did hear about the cheese and wine day, <laughs> uh, which which turned into, yeah, that's a famous story of our drunkenness. And you'll have to just tune in another time to hear about that. But yeah, normally that ends with a massive cocktail that you've made that's about four times as strong as cocktails should be. And then there's just death and horribleness and the worst hangovers ever. So we haven't had that. I haven't had that in a while. <laughs> but soon. Soon, but soon. Soon, so soon. Well, Nick. Hello. Are you ready? To drink cocktails and talk about poison. Oh, go on then. Or we could <laughs> drink some poison and talk about cocktails. What if we do both? What? what? I, I don't like the way this is going, Nick. <laughs> There's stuff that you haven't told me and now I'm afraid. I'm afraid, Nick. Okay, well, can we go with the first one? <laughs> fine. Boring. Fine. Okay, fine. Well, you know what? It is Nick's story this week. Episode 40. Woohoo, woohoo, woohoo. Woo. But as we've established, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly tell a story without a cocktail in hand. Yay. As you know, each week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and it will flavour the cocktail of the week. As it's Nick's story, he got to choose the secret ingredient. Mm. And Nick, the secret ingredient this week is... Is, is also, it's so very tasty. So right. very tasty. A lovely sakatot. 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 Is that how you pronounce it? Um... I don't know. My Aust- <laughs> my Viennese pronunciation is not 
known for its authenticity. Okay. So it is an ingredient in a cocktail, an entire cake? Yes, yes. Or a tort, excuse me. A tort, it's not a cake. In fact, well, it is a cake, actually. If you see the pictures, it's very much a cake. Well, is a tort a cake? Let's start a debate. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> um, yeah, it's not a debate I'm going to get into, to be honest. <laughs> that I is don't. a political hot potato you will not touch. I, I don't really care if it's a cake or not. It's damn lovely. So what is a uh, th- 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 tort? I still can't pronounce it. <laughs> Saka. Saka, soccer, soccer tort, Saka tort. It's basically it's right, a explain. traditional Viennese cake basically sponge delicate sponge lots of apricot a very dark chocolate sort of mirror icing and it's glaze you mirror glaze and it was made for some sort of 18th century king or something in honor i don't know i don't know where it comes from but it's associated with vienna oh, and really? it's been on it's been like the technical challenge on the bake-off and all that sort of stuff so it's, it's a well-known thing <laughs> if it's been on bake-off bloody hell man i mean my god so google it you'll I, know i do like a tort um i like a good mirror glaze never made one never will god damn it this is intriguing uh have we had well we, we haven't had cake since uh since the very 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 since first the very episode, very first one which was dundee cake. 40 episodes Episodes ago. 40 episodes, we are commemorating episode one with yet more cake. We are. Cake on death. See, and also, I mean, I believe I did tell you there should have been a cake for me for episode 40. Did I? A big sort of like celebration birthday cake thing going on. To be fair, I did bring you a slice of cake this very you actually day. You did bring me a slice of so cake So maybe you should today. shut the fuck up, Nick. <laughs> 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 okay, I actually did get a cake today. You're right, so you I can't complain. Bit of, but you actually got birthday cake. You got actual delicious birthday yeah. cake made by a good friend of ours Not and ate it, and yet you're demanding more. Podcast birthday cake. <laughs> it's a very different type of birthday cake. Well, I, th- I think we should be sent <laughs> a birthday cake. People out there, get mixing. Please don't send us poison cake. Okay, then. So with, with, the, with the special Viennese tort, we, I mean, it sounds delicious. If we could just have that on a glass with some vodka poured over it, I'd be happy. I'm sensing that's not the way you've gone. Exactly then. the way I've gone. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that true? Then? It is true. Or is it just lie? No, it is true. I have made this cocktail up. What? Okay. There are a couple of sort of things out there on us, like a sack of tort cocktail, <laughs> sack of tort martini. Fuck that, no. So, and I didn't like the sound of any of them, really. So I right. made my own cocktail. So you've made one I up? I have made one up. Ooh, it's a true original a for true episode 40. true original. And I have to say that the more you say sack of tort, there are two things going through my head. One is sack of juwea. <laughs> um, one is uh, sack of tort, sack of tort, sack of tort, tort, sack of con. Yeah, uh, yes, no. No, no, there's, there's no... <laughs> There's no Shaka Khan involved in this cocktail whatsoever. God damn it. Well, just once I ask for a disco legend <laughs> to be involved in the cocktails. Okay, so what is the name of this thing you've made? Do you have I one? have named it a Sucker Punch. <laughs> Why did I not see that coming? <laughs> <laughs> sucker Punch, like a Sucker Punch or a sack, sack Suck It To You kind of. Oh, well, yeah, exactly, it works. Yeah. Oh, it works on so it many works, levels. It's so many levels. It's multi leveled. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, a Sack of Punch. I'm really excited now. I'm really excited. But also, I've just remembered I have to be scared because of what you said earlier. So, Nick has delivered me a very beautiful bottle full of mysterious liquid. Well, we both have to go to our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. So, we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a minute. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, a uh, sack of punch. Sack of punch. Sack of punch. In a tiny wee glass. Tiny wee glass. Okay, I may have poured a slightly larger glass. <laughs> <laughs> it looks lovely. Beautiful golden hue. Mm. Ooh. Mm. And thick and gloopy, and I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, it is a, a curious texture. Okay, well, I uh, a shudder to ask, Nick. Do you want to talk us through it, or do we have to taste no, it? No, no, I want you to try it first. Oh, we're flipping it up. Okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try. No, no, hang on, wait, no. There's what? Half the people are listening to this screaming, going, if he's just been taunting you about poison, don't be one of those people and just drink it. I will drink it too, at the same time. Oh, right, I want to see you drink Right, at the same time. We're going to drink at the same time. Okay, okay ready? One, two, three. Ooh, that's very nice. <laughs> if it is poison, it's damn tasty. <laughs> <laughs> it is, in fact, not poison. Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, I fooled you. you. <laughs> <laughs> there was a little bit of me that was like... Made you think you were going to die. <laughs> 
Well, I did think you've got those beautiful belladonna seeds from Carla Valentine. Did he mix them in with some Just drink? Just ground <laughs> those up in there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, whatever it is, it's, it's damn tasty. Talk us through it, Nick. I'm glad you like. Well, it's it's a combination of many random things. Now, the, the main ingredients in a sack of are apricot and chocolate. Yes. Those are the two big flavours. Okay. I'm hoping you might be able to taste apricot and chocolate i do i do <laughs> and it's, it's basically it's a bit of a, a drink that i had to come up with with what i had in the cupboard so after work today i went out scouring town to try and find some apricot liqueur i thought some apricot brandy something like that went to three supermarkets could not find a thing so what i had to do is i bought some apricot jam <laughs> then some tequila <laughs> I'm, I'm, and i brought it home and i Set much the same like you did with the red currant for a previous drink. So I took my inspiration from you on that one and made like an apricot syrup. So it's got vodka, it's got the apricot, it has got a creme de cacao and a bit of coffee. Because coffee? coffee and chocolate That's amazing. always good. That stirred with some ice to give it a nice dilution because the apricot mm. is quite thick. But a lot of, a stir with lots of ice helps dilute it down and really chill it. And I think it's actually perfectly okay. lovely. You wouldn't want a big glass of it. I'm going to level with you, Nick. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. Yeah? That tastes like a cake in a glass it is gorgeous it is it genuinely does oh, i'm so pleased i think that's one of the best things you've ever made i can't genuinely oh that's very kind i'm, I'm going all kind of master chef here i'm like the complexity of the flavors it's all there hanging on the spoon no it's it's amazing it's really really nice you get the apricot you get the chocolate you get that that coffee but bloody hell man i can't believe you put coffee in there it's great it does it and it as soon as you said it the sack at all I'm like, yeah, it tastes like one of those cakes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so that makes me so happy. But I'm glad I'm glad you like it. I'm proud of you, Nick. We're all very, very I'm proud, proud of, of you. myself. <laughs> <laughs> Guys. Ooh, and an apricot jam, most of you will have it on your toast or your croissant. So yeah, easy. Easy mate. So the recipe was so I'm undecided the recipe might be out on Friday or it might be behind a huge paywall or something because <laughs> it's that good. <laughs> With Nick's face on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to pay me a thousands of dollars to get the recipe for this one it's that good um or it'll be out on friday <laughs> great resounding success of a cocktail i'm so excited everybody his book will be coming out at the end of the year it? it's perfect in time <laughs> for christmas so with our sack of punch firmly in hand is it time for a story nick it's absolutely it's time for a story yes and i hope you like this story this week for episode 40 we have the story of frederick moore's um, a man who has actually confessed to eight murders, oh. but who escaped justice and vanished, never to be seen again. Good God, man. Is he the surprise that was the poisoning bit of this story that you were saying? Yes, he's here and he's here tonight. And he's here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Frederick Morse is born in Vienna. Vienna! In Austria. In Austria. 1889. But he is not in Austria for long. And at the age of 25, in 1914, he emigrates to America and Ooh. sets up in New York. That is the Viennese link that you're going to get in this episode. So that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. He was from Vienna. You went from Vienna to, to the sack of tort. Yes. What? I like cake. <laughs> As a child, he was fed the cake. And that... hey, he would have had the cake in the many cafes that lined the Viennese squares. Coffee and cake is a very Viennese thing. He would have been there. He probably would have eaten it at some point. He never stopped making it. When he moved to New York, just cakes everywhere. His first business venture was to open this kind of torch shop, yet it failed. Yes. Okay, fine. Okay, we'll go with you on that one. I'm feeling benevolent because it's such a lovely cocktail. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Now, we do not know why he decides to leave Austria, but the timing is slightly curious. 1914, Europe is on the brink of war. Austria-Hungary being one of the main combatants in that conflict. And I have no doubt that he may well be trying to sort of escape conscription. Oh, oh, oh dear. Because he's a, of a fighting age. He perhaps just wants to get the hell out of there. Uh, th that is one possibility, but the timing is quite coincidental. Fair enough. If he's lived his life just drinking coffee and eating cake, he's probably quite fat, doesn't want to go into the war. He's like, oh no, America, they love a bit of cake. It's fine. <laughs> but he is, a, he is an educated man. He speaks German and English um, incredibly well. Ooh. So it does not take him at all long to find work um, in New York. And he finds work at the German Oddfellows home Ooh. in the Bronx. Nice which is very, very jolly. They do good works and such like this. And the, 
in New York, in the Bronx, they have set up a home for Germans who have emigrated, perhaps fallen in hard times. Um, it also mm. operates as an orphanage as well. It's a good place. Um, and yes. he gets a job there as a porter. Porter. In the porter, in the, the hospital wing. It soon becomes clear that he is a rather eccentric chap. <laughs> right. And has rather grand ideas. He tells tales of the old country where he was supposedly a legendary hunter out in the forests and fields around vienna hunting but you'd hope it would be in the forest and the fields not in the yeah not just down the streets and things <laughs> <laughs> at the home he is fascinated by medical procedures which is generally never a good sign bit of a red flag it's, it is a bit of a red flag he visits hospitals on his days off and rather overstates his role at the home making out that he is in fact a medical man himself and as such he is given permission to observe surgical procedures um, where they are demonstrating new techniques and new methods and things they often often have people watching yeah you'd have a lot of medical students so so i'm hoping he says medical student or he makes an elaborate lie rather than just walking in with his hands on his hips going i'm a medicine man (laughs) so yeah he he cons his way into these these theatres literally uh, okay. where he observes what's going on he goes to hear lectures on these new techniques and mm. things um, and he spends an awful lot of his free time learning all he can about different medications and their effects on the body and what different things do in normal life we'd be saying well done lovely he's got a medical yeah. future for us on the podcast mm. big warning <laughs> sirens going off warning um, warning and i mean being able to con his way into these events surrounded by legitimate doctors and students and professionals uh, inflates his ego hugely he takes to wearing a white coat and a stethoscope (laughs) around his neck at the at the home the Um, classic classic sign absolutely do we think he's a doctor well he has a stethoscope so he has a stethoscope okay fair enough he sort of lords it over the other junior staff and the patients as well he insists that the elderly patients address him as hair doctor what so he's got quite the okay that's creepy yeah indeed delusions he's got quite the opinion of himself and the yeah delusions absolutely i mean obviously he has no medical credentials whatsoever the younger staff and patients just seem to laugh it off oh it's old fred getting a bit carried away he's a bit quirky he's german a bit weird um (laughs) but a lot of the a lot of the older patients the elderly patients actually live in absolute terror because he is so abusive and so strict and harsh so he has a a mixed reputation for from his superiors he is the ideal person he he's interested he's there and from the younger people they all get on well with him and he's a bit of a laugh but from some of the patients he's a he's a terror surely that should be a sign one would think yeah the, the administrators shouldn't be going oh he's a laugh he's a laugh patients fucking terrified of him absolutely shitting themselves every time he comes around and makes the rounds yeah they're really crying and weeping but you know what he's fun he's fun oh let's just keep him on he's just a bit eccentric he's basically harmless and they probably are discounting the older patients complaints aren't they because well, they're a bit loony yeah they're old and going oh, they're in there this. for a reason yeah probably not the highest level of care that's going on oh. yeah, well indeed morse works at the odd fellows home for just over six months before he is actually fired oh, his good. his ego has actually started to cause real problems he is starting to get even the administration at this point they say he is starting to get far too big for his boots he is disappearing every other day to go and witness some awful surgery um, Mm. or listen to some lecture now in his mind these are absolutely perfectly valid reasons to leave work (laughs) to to leave work he is furthering his education he is bettering the the services available at the home but they start going you're employed as a porter you're not a doctor you're not a student or anything like that you're skiving half the time we have no idea where you are this was fun this was funny for a bit yeah. you pretending to be a doctor now you're actually just not doing it so job. off you go mr moores out you go now he is obviously none too happy about this <laughs> and he starts he starts planning his payback he'll get a bigger step as well. <laughs> indeed he has now got four coats on <laughs> no one could compete with that no one could argue with him on february the 2nd 1915 moore's barges into the office of the district attorney uh, charles perkins now he wants to make it known that he is a serious man a man of substance um so he dresses 
uh, what he thinks is appropriately in his Austrian corduroy hunting attire, complete with uh, leather shorts and a feathered alpine hat. <laughs> because he has to make the right impression to convey his authority and seriousness. Oh, let's just picture that for a minute. Let's just picture that. Someone walking in, hands, hands on, on hips, hips absolutely. fists on hips, standing there, leather shorts. And the, the district attorney's probably going, I'm going to need a minute to take all of this in. <laughs> Whatever you say, yes, have my money and my support. <laughs> now, obviously, I mean, the officials that day are generally quite taken aback by this <laughs> dramatic arrival. But then he starts telling a tale. He starts telling tales about deadly poisonings um, <gasps> going on at the German odd fellows hall about all these deaths that have been going on that have been hushed up and kept quiet they have to take this seriously no matter how ridiculous he is dressed he is telling a story (laughs) that needs to be investigated they cannot just ignore this fair enough um so the new york coroner a chap called james dunn is tasked with investigating these claims to see if there is any validity in what moore's has reported though when they learn that more has recently been fired they do start to go mm, mm, really perhaps we should be taking this with a pinch of mm. salt but Morse does not relent in his uh, accusations and he continues to go and visit the office uh, office of the the coroner to continue to make these claims and he is making quite the spectacle of himself and Based on his bizarre antics and the fanciful, they they believe now, nature of his story, he is actually quietly placed in the psychiatric wing of a Bellevue hospital um, for observation. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you should go over there for a bit. Does he just come in with... Okay, okay that didn't work yesterday. Okay, I need more shorts and a yeah. bigger feather. I need a bigger hat, bigger feather, yeah. shorter shorts, bigger feather. I need to yodel this as I come in. Yep. So, but how do you quietly place someone in a well, mental hospital in a psychiatric <laughs> ward? Do you just kind of just leave a trail of candy and just like, <laughs> well, I think... or a selection of tort that he can follow <laughs> to the door? I think that's exactly what they did. Ooh, a piece of toy. Obviously, Ooh, a piece of toy. he has no family in New York. He has rather alienated himself from his work colleagues. So there's no one mm. there who's really going to question it. If the authorities turn around and say, right. "Oh, I see, I see," for I see. your own safety. Um, we need to put you in under observation. No one's going to go, oh no, he should be out on the streets. And there's no yeah. family there to oh, go oh. let him out. Well, sounds like a good idea in this case. But despite him being put under observation, the investigation does continue. They do still think, okay, we hmm. need to, let's just get to the bottom of this, just make sure there really is nothing going on. However, the coroner learns oh. of an alarmingly high number of patient deaths that have occurred over the past few months at the home. And he is forced to draw the conclusion that actually something is strange. Something strange is going on here. This is not at all as it, as it should be. The home houses around 250 orphans and over 100 men and women. So it's a big establishment. Ooh, I mean, you're, That's a big you're almost talking sort of like workhouse type structure um it's it's a, it's a big place now i mean obviously they they have records going back to show what is the average death rate at such a place i mean people do die in these places for no suspicious mm. reasons whatsoever they are there to house the most the people who are most down on their luck who are destitute have got nowhere else to go the sick so people do die so they have like a, a baseline death rate that they think oh that's pretty pretty acceptable pretty average however what they see in the last sort of six months or so is considerably higher in the last six months they've got about about 15 more deaths than they would anticipate which is a considerable number something needs to be investigated all of these people the death certificate has been put down natural causes, natural causes, natural causes, natural causes. <laughs> Written five times. <laughs> Written right five, on each one, it's got it five times. Really sure it's natural, natural causes. causes. Natural causes, natural causes, natural causes, natural causes. No questions! I mean, during the investigation that follows, the coroner um, quickly turns up a number of irregularities. He finds Ooh. that the physician who has actually signed these death certificate has never even seen most of these patients. They're just oh, bits wow. of paper that has come across his desk and he's just signed it off going, yeah, okay, another dead person at the old fellow's home and on to the next thing. Well, he's not a good physician. No, 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 yeah, not bad at all. Physician. He also discovers that the, the, the person in charge of the, the medicine cabinet um, at the home is a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> right. <laughs> One of the orphans um, at the home has, has actually been put in charge of the dispensary. 
Uh, you have questions. Yeah. So not actually prescribing medicine. It was down to this girl to... To go fetch. To, to, to go, go and fetch, fetch the right thing, find oh, the right bottles. Oh, but that was the style of the time. Children, go fetch me the poison and that one and the morphine <laughs> one for yourself. It's all right. There we go. Oh, bloody hell. Well, 14, you know, she's not, not that young. She's she's still a child. Okay. Still a child. Still a child. Still so perhaps... a child dealing with very various medicines. Yeah, no, perhaps not the best choice to dispense heavy medication. And she was a girl as well. And she and she was a girl. Um, bloody hell. And I mean, they probably did. They didn't pay her at all, so it's, it's fine, really. She's not going to do a good job then is she nah she's got a roof over her head what more does she want and and free access to drugs and free access to drugs she's having a they, great time she's having a fantastic time she's she's making a mint selling all this stuff on the side um, <laughs> they decide that the best way to get to the bottom of all this is to exhume the bodies and do some proper autopsies yay in the bodies of the earliest victims they find clear signs of arsenic poisoning Arsenic! Arsenic alarm! Arsenic alarm. alarm indeed. They have no issue declaring these as murder. Terrible, terrible murders. <laughs> In the later, more recent deaths, they come across something rather different. These people have died from chloroform exposure. Oh. Something quite, quite, quite different. Quite different and yet quite clever. In a way. The, the coroner has the superintendent of the home, a chap called Adam Bangert, um, brought in for questioning. Um, how could he not have known about these deaths? How could he have not been suspicious? I mean, was he complicit in these evil crimes? Bangert is, is locked up while they continue their investigation. And two other orderlies from the home are also held as witnesses to all sorts this is of good. things. good. I'm quite liking this investigation that there's no question of like, the doctors oh, fucking lock them up immediately. Yeah, absolutely. This, this coroner he's going for him one of these orderlies admits that he has actually smelled chloroform in the room of one of the victims mm. um chloroform's got a quite a sweet sickly sort of aroma to it well, th- um, we'll never, says, never yeah. do that thing when someone goes does this rag smell of chloroform and smell it just mm. <laughs> yeah he smells this chloroform in a room of a, an elderly patient named henry handel but he's actually warned off by bangert and told to leave the patient alone what and the orderly says well he's my boss I'm going to do what I'm told. Okay. So this only sort of raises more suspicions about Banger. What is his involvement in all this? Or did he really just not care? Or was he saying, no, leave the poor person alone. They're obviously tired. It doesn't smell of chloroform. And they need a good nap. (laughs) As they complete these autopsies uh, on all the recently deceased patients, Coroner Dunn announces to the press that the recent deaths are all murders. He says there is a plot to get rid of the oldest, the most senile, Mm. those that were most in the way and caused the most trouble. In each instant, he says, I believe that a rag soaked with chloroform was held over the face of a victim. Each victim was found dead in the morning and was generally supposed to have died during the night of natural causes without medical attention. Mm. It's the statement he gives to the to the press who have gathered. That's awful. <laughs> now, while Adam Banger it seems the most obvious suspect at first, he has the medical knowledge. He has access to everywhere in the home. Uh, there is a witness that claims that Banger ordered him out of the room. But then they also have Frederick Moores locked up. He is definitely an odd chap. (laughs) But as they continue investigating, they start hearing tales about how terrified all the elderly patients were um, of him um, and his strange obsessions with medical treatments and the effectiveness of different drugs. As I say, I mean, he has been locked up in Bellevue Hospital all the while these investigations have been going on. And he is absolutely delighted when these investigators come to visit him and asking all these questions. He is loving the attention. Straight away, he confesses to all the murders. Oh my God, okay. I, all the death, yes, I did that. Ha ha, the feather in my hat told me to do it. It's all (laughs) me. Has he been there the whole time rattling the cage and going, it was me. (laughs) My God, we'll never crack this case. I'm in here. He tells the assistant district attorney in his confession that the patients were so old they were a nuisance he admits to using arsenic for the first murders but then tells of how he switched to chloroform later as it was so much easier to obtain and obviously this is borne out by the results from the autopsies so they know mm. that he must have known this information there is further witness testimony from a teenager from the home um, who tells the police that she ran an errand for moors collecting a bottle of chloroform from another orderly and delivering it right. to moors in a patient's room that patient, Ferdinand Schultz, 
died that night. It's all being pieced together, isn't it? All coming together. (laughs) Throughout all this, he shows absolutely no sign of shame, guilt at all. He insists that he had killed them to put them out of their misery. He refers to the victims as superannuated octogenarians. Bloody hell. (laughs) Say superannuated being outdated Mm. and obsolete. They passed away as children fall asleep and their suffering ended for all time. Yeah, I'm, I'm don't think that that was what happened no no if no. everyone is terrified i think if you're coming at someone with a rag everyone else is gonna see you with one of his victims he is reported sitting at the bedside smoking a cigarette and waiting for the chloroform to take effect oh my god though who actually witnesses that i don't know but then again like if he's been on this ward and all these older people all these patients that no one has listened to for ages mm. he's obviously in this ward and he could do that Don't and it would have been an open have ward as well. I mean, not everyone, yeah. not everyone's going to have their own room or anything. It'd be a big open ward. So perhaps he was just sitting next to someone. Yeah, just having a cigarette. Yeah, yeah having fine, a having fine. a smoke. People smoked everywhere yeah, in indeed. hospitals. Cigarettes were fine, absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> Healthy, they're good for you. Health, it opens up the lungs. Yeah, quite. Now you would think that they have all this evidence of foul play plus a man who has confessed and knows details that only the perpetrator could know. That this would be slam dunk. Easy prosecution, not a problem at all. Mm. But it becomes an absolute legal nightmare. Police from three different counties um, wrestle over jurisdiction, all trying to take credit for the capture of this monster. I mean, despite the fact that none of them knew what was going on until he handed himself in, all of the children in the home including the 14-year-old pharmacist, um, (laughs) are are removed by the local children's society and scattered across the state, rehoused. Tracking them down to get more statements proves an absolute nightmare. James Dunn, the coroner, he actually starts coming under attack as well because he is still holding Adam Bangert, the superintendent, in jail over his suspected roles in these deaths. It it may well be that Bangert was in fact negligent um, Mm. in that he didn't see what was going on under his nose. But there was no way that he was a conspirator in these crimes. But he's still being held. In the meantime, Frederick Moores is having a great time. <laughs> he is loving the attention. The press are hounding, battering down the doors of the hospital to get interviews and stuff like that. Oh, wow. He is gleefully reenacting the murders for the benefits of the doctors who were sent to assess him. Let me let me show you how I did it all. These assessors eventually conclude that he is a criminally insane megalomaniac. Oh, yeah. So he's sort of like a Lex Luthor type thing. (laughs) That bitch crazy. Newspapers continue to publish every salacious gossipy detail that they can dig up, including various allegations of abuse and neglect that have been occurring at the home, uh, whether or not Moores was implicated or not. But of course, it's it's just scandal. It's gossip. It's something to be brought up. Do they interview the feather? Now, that I don't know. Mm. We do not know what happened to the feather. (laughs) He's probably in police custody still. (laughs) Just been lost to the system. While all this is going on, authorities receive a letter from a man in Germany uh, claiming to be Frederick Moore's father. So this case has obviously got global coverage That's big news big news it's big news yeah. and he, perhaps his picture has been in relevant papers and stuff like that and someone in germany has recognized him and his father has written to the new york authority saying this is my son his name is not frederick moores his name is carl frederick menerick is his actual name hmm. and i mean his father does describe him as being prone to odd behavior even before he left Vienna. The authorities, they leap on this little bit of information. Based on his entering the United States under a a false name, they make attempts to deport him. This could soon all be someone else's problem. Oh, okay. Now, since the the only concrete, solid evidence they have against Moores is his own confession, he has just been declared as a criminally insane megalomaniac. (laughs) He actually never stands trial. He is transferred to the Hudson State River Hospital in Poughkeepsie, waiting Mm -hmm. for deportation back to Austria. The investigation fizzles out. The superintendent and the orderlies who have been held are released. The German Oddfellows home changes its name. It manages to stay open, despite the persistent rumours. I'm just thinking, why would they, why would you want to deport someone? You've got a case an like, incredible case of all these deaths on your hand why wouldn't you want to solve it I'm, I'm the only thing i can think of is money it's gonna cost it's gonna a cost a lot of money to do that well what's the what if he is insane the death penalty is there but can you actually can you execute a crazy person would you then gonna have to lock them up for the no, rest of their life and then, and then yeah, there's obviously again, huge the expense of, of having to to do that can we just ship him over there 
someone else's problem. A year passes and Moores is still stuck in the state hospital. I mean, most of Europe is on fire at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Austria-Hungary are in no rush to accept this crazy person back into Vienna. No, Um, exactly. (laughs) We have problems of our own over here right now. Without having to deal with this chap as well. So no thank you. Franz Ferdinand's going, I've got bigger things on my fucking plate. (laughs) On the 12th of May, 1916, Frederick Moores escapes. No. He escapes the secure hospital and vanishes into the night. Woo-hoo-hoo. The police in surrounding towns are alerted and told to remain vigilant. Yeah. But there is surprisingly little fuss at the idea of an escaped insane murderer roaming free. No one seems overly bothered. There is a manhunt. Did he escape disguised as a doctor but potentially Did perhaps he... he just stole a stethoscope and then he was out the door he literally just pushed someone over put on a coat and a stethoscope <laughs> no one questioned it whatsoever no one questioned it and then yeah. all the police were saying like okay let's look for the feather and the hat and he's got leather shorts on so this uh, a police they do launch a manhunt for him they turn up nothing cannot find him at all and then in the months that pass public interest dies down the story has been relegated to a little corner on the bottom of the paper somewhere no one is bothered first world war is still going on there are growing calls for the u.s to become mm. involved there are much more important things going on in the world than one crazy man frederick moore's is never heard of again and the tale might have stopped there in a rather unsatisfactory uh, sort, of, sort of way but oh so as we said europe midst of horrendous horrendous war u.s industrial output is soaring to produce all the military supplies that are streaming across the atlantic to europe plus there are ever-growing confidence that the u.s is going to enter the war factories <laughs> are booming i love that like any day now any day now the u.s any, well, pretty much in. it was like any day they're going to come yes, they're going to come to the rescue, oh, they're trust come me, to the rescue. we know we know the europeans were like bloody <laughs> hell where have you been come on so factories are popping up all over the place to produce these munitions and supplies and what have you. Mm-hmm. And this is certainly true of a town, the town of Torrington. Torrington? Um, Torrington. Fuck off. No, wait a minute. Yes, Torrington. Indeed. Torrington. Yes, where our dear friend Master Tim lives. In Devon, there is a town called Torrington where Tim from Expert Witnesses on Patreon lives. Good friend of ours. Oh, Torrington in the USA. Oh, well, the But this is Torrington, is Connecticut. Seat. Oh, Connecticut. This is Torrington, oh, Connecticut. So a slightly different place. Very, I'm, I'm suspecting very different. <laughs> Where the recently opened Torrington factory has been operating at full capacity. Mm-hmm. Now, factories are dangerous places, especially at this time, health and safety. What's health and safety? <laughs> None of that. <laughs> Regulations are pretty hit and miss. And, blah, 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 you, and can, oh. you, can get, you can lose a leg, you can lose a limb, you can lose your heart to love because you'll fall in love with the former. Exactly. There are big machines, metal flying around the place, explosive okay, chemicals. Okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> um, it is. It's a, it's a munitions factory. It's pretty in, bad. You go in there and it's just like an exploding fireworks Yeah, you go factory. in there and you explode. <laughs> Dodging bits of metal. Just go, what are you here for the accounts? My God, I'm so stressed. Injuries are unavoidable. <laughs> Um, in such conditions but the torrington factory is forward thinking and quite progressive Um, and they have their own on-site first aid department so they can quickly deal with injuries and get those workers back on the production line back on the production line (laughs) none of this time off malarkey get back there making things it is staffed by a doctor and his rather eccentric assistant a short chap with a clipped german accent and a penchant for feathered caps. What? Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Is the doctor called Dr. Frankenstein? <laughs> I do not know the doctor's because name. Because I swear to God, the guy sounds like Igor for a minute. <laughs> oh my God. He's just hunched, isn't he? Scuttling along. Yes, master. <laughs> it, is, it is not clear when Frederick Maurice Benno, as he, the name is now, uh, we, we do not know when he begins working as the physician's assistant at the factory. But he soon becomes a well-known fixture in Torrington. Mm -hmm. He is Mm well-liked in the town. He is something of a curiosity. (laughs) Uh, He has a rather peculiar manner, a strange way of dressing. But he is respected and liked for his work treating the injured. And he may well have gone on living in Torrington quite happily under the radar, but a problem comes along. The US does enter the war against Germany Germany and Austria-Hungary. Suddenly, Frederick is officially designated an enemy alien. Um, And he needs to be registered with the US government to remain in the country. He completes his registration form. And during the (laughs) checks that the authorities complete, they find no one by the name of Frederick Maurice Bino um, has ever entered the country. 
for all intents and purposes, Frederick Moroy Speno does not exist for the US government. Which is going to send off alarm bells, isn't it? Oh my God. Which oh my exactly God, oh my God. sets off major alarm bells. Police go to speak to him in February uh, 1918, um, and he raises further suspicions by being deliberately vague about his activities between 1915 and 1917. <laughs> he will not tell them where he's been, what he's been doing, anything like oh, that. Timing. Anything before he arrived in Torrington, he will not reveal. He's charged with violating his residency permit um, in that he doesn't have one. Uh, but he is soon released back to Torrington. They've probably got more important things. He's not considered a flight risk or anything like that. Mm. Now, but despite his release, the publicity over his arrest has cost him his job. It has made life in Torrington incredibly difficult. Yeah. The locals who he once considered friends and colleagues become hostile and suspicious. Uh, he is America is now at war with Germany and Austria. He is an um, Austrian German. Why is he so abusive about what he's been doing before? Is he some sort of super secret spy? Has he come to steal all the Torrington based secrets? <laughs> um they don't know. They are suspicious. In April, he disappears. He leaves behind three letters to people in the town announcing that he will be committing suicide. He leaves three suicide notes oh. to, to those who he had considered, no doubt, friends. And they fear the worst for Frederick. They are worried. The police and the local scout troop search the local woods for any trace of his body. The local scout group, sorry, what? The local scout troop, yes. Yes, I was wondering if you are going to pick that up. field trip ever. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, kids, so, put on your gloves. We're going to try and find a body in the woods. Yeah. What badge will this get me? It will, you know, <laughs> it's best not to ask, little Timmy, okay? <laughs> Let's go in there. You know, you won't sleep for a while, but it's okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, so, so I'm not too sure about the ethics of sending out Boy Scouts to look for dead bodies, but but, but that is just me and my sort of millennial sensibilities. Um, so. <laughs> oh, if they were like a really young Boy Scouts group. I'm imagining they were probably like 15, 16. That's fucking traumatising yeah. no matter what. But if, oh my God, what if they're 10? <laughs> what do we do today? Are we off to build a den in the woods? You could say that. We're going to, well, less building, more digging. They, they do not find anything though. They, they, they find nothing. And on this occasion, I'm glad. Yes. No one in the town <laughs> is that bothered. Um, he is the enemy now. And the police all chastising this this scout group for not finding a dead body. For not body, finding them, yeah, Beating absolutely. the kids as they go back, going, you didn't look in the river! You didn't look hard enough. <laughs> oh, he has probably run off. Best to see the back of him. And again, that would have been the end of the story <laughs> for Frederick Benno. There's more. If, if. if it hadn't been... <laughs> For a factory worker <laughs> what? named Henry Godair. Godair. He sounds suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Henry is having his lunch at the factory one day um, and he's flipping through an old magazine that's on the table. It's an old magazine dated March the 21st, 1915. That's about three years old or so. That's very specific. <laughs> I know. Well, it's, it's, it was taken into evidence and things. Oh, he's really reading cool. through these articles and stuff like that and something stops him. He sees a picture he sees a picture of the of the man he knows as 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 doctor as doctor Benno. Sorry, I just for a minute there it was it was just oh he sees a picture of what of naked ladies, but next to it is a really interesting article. <laughs> I was reading this, honestly I wasn't oh my god, this guy <laughs> There is a story about Frederick Moores and his murders. It is a picture of the man that he knows as Doctor as Frederick Benno. Ah. Um, now, Godet is so alarmed by this resemblance, this striking resemblance, that he begins showing the picture to his co-workers, many of whom have been treated uh, by Benno over the, the years he's, he's been there. Yes. And all of them agree that he is the spitting image of this crazy megalomaniac um, who is written about in this article. Mm. Godet goes to the police. A new investigation is launched. They check with the New York authorities about Moore's supposed prison status and they find that he indeed escaped in 1916 torrington police again launch a huge investigation not only did benno perfectly fit the description of frederick moores um, including all his eccentricities and odd way of dressing but police have discovered that he had given a cigarette case with the initials fm to a man that he had been sharing a boarding house with in torrington oh. again all the nearby towns are notified but no trace 
of this now escaped fugitive <laughs> are found at all. People in Torrington were are understandably horrified by all this. Um, Frederick had gone from friendly, quirky factory doctor to enemy alien, now to crazed murderer. Um, so it's quite a progression he's 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 gone through, and the, and people who considered him a friend are understandably shocked yeah. um, by these these developments and not wanting to be implicated or to know to admit they know him. Um, but as with all these things, the case of Frederick Moore's Frederick Benno dies down, and after a few months, the townspeople simply want to forget it ever happened and just get on with their lives. Once again, Frederick has escaped. Mm. It's not until 1923 that the question of what happened to Moores is finally answered. Okay. In an abandoned farm in Northfield, Connecticut, not far from Torrington, a skeleton is discovered. <gasps> Despite having no head and one hand missing uh. and the absence of any identifying marks, a coroner formally identifies the body and concludes that it is Moores. It is Frederick Moores. He believes that he has poisoned himself. And at some point after he he has died, the body has decayed and his extremities have been run off. Animals have scavenged and his parts, his head and his hand have gone walk about and are now lining some fox's den somewhere. (laughs) It's a very macabre fox rather than just eating it. (laughs) Well, indeed. I just need need this skull to adorn my den so no one will come in. It's a very goth (laughs) fox sitting inside being upset with itself. Two bottles are found next to the corpse, one containing whiskey and the other empty with no way of telling what it once contained. The spot Frederick had chosen for his suicide was isolated enough to ensure that his body would not be discovered for years. No one ever went there. The formal identification of the body as Moore's allowed the Torrington authorities to close the book once and for all on the disappearance. It also meant that at long last, police in New York could finally close the file on the death of eight patients linked to Moore's once and for all. <sighs> and it is the story of Frederick Moore's, the man who escaped. Da, da, da. Yay! Oh, good story. Just when you think it's going to end, there's another twist. I know. Oh, <laughs> oh, many things. Oh, that story had everything. Now that's got... Now I'm... I... Do we think he really died? Do you think that was his body? Well, I think... I think it potentially. I think it probably was. Maybe. Maybe. Um, How do you identify it well, without the dental records? I mean, unless they had well, that many. I don't know. It just. It just seems a bit convenient. It seems very convenient to find a body, well, it does. a John Doe, with no identification, and you can go. Yeah, you know what? It's this person who's escaped, and people are frightened, and this is a massive fuck up on our part. Well, this is this is five years after the. He's yeah. run off. So he, he runs in in 1918 and he's not found until 20... The body's not found until 23. Yeah. So it's like five years after. Um, so it is like skeletal remains at this but, point. But I don't know, there's a little bit of me that he's run that much. Well, this is this is true. He's he's escaped that much. Did, did he indeed? Did he live his life out merrily in another town somewhere, posing as another assistant or another yeah. physician somewhere? And he died of happy old age. <laughs> Laughing and cackling. <laughs> 30 but years later or something a, yeah what an absolute psychopath oh completely interesting there's such someone who is obviously at the beginning part is such mm. a nutter and has very clearly killed these people but he was not suspected of anything untoward yeah. in torrington um there he was not there was no hint of anything of going awry so can someone flip to being such a crazy psychopath to being a Normal well, that's what I was going to draw on. When you look back on kind of these murderers and psychopaths and people go, oh, they were always wrong ones and people think, oh, there must have been signs from the start. I think it sounds like someone like him, he was eccentric and people probably laughed it off and kind of tolerated him sure. until they got too uncomfortable. I don't think probably from the start he was very liked and he was just, oh, jolly, lovely kind of person, really like, you know, if you imagine someone who's quite an eccentric that you really kind of have arm's length from. You know, you sort of Mm. see this eccentric character and you go, oh, they're fine, they're harmless, they're just a bit quirky and they're funny and you have a laugh with them, but you don't really get involved with them until that person turns because you probably don't know them or don't get very close to them and then suddenly they are a monster. So it does sound like that he clearly was complete megalomaniac as was described completely deluded yes, absolutely. was willing to kill people had no remorse was going to walk around continue trying to practice medicine probably everyone around him he, he, that's 
the terrifying thing. You have those kind of people who are just so weird, but they bluster on. The confidence stops anyone from questioning you. You've got someone who's really weird and someone who is just wearing a feather hat, but no, also indeed. is talking about, oh, I'm a doctor and I really understand medicine. You're not going to turn around and go, no, you don't, out of town with you. You're probably just going to go, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's all Fred again. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, it's all, it's, it's, it's all Fred again. It sounds yeah. like he was a genuinely yeah. <laughs> creepy person. Yeah. And that, oh, God. Mm. But generally thought he was a doctor and thought he was going to do right. But yeah, del completely deluded. <laughs> he thought he was doing uh, grand things. Is he still out there? Completely. Is he still out there? Is he still out there now? Probably not now, though. <laughs> no. um, he's behind the door. Oh, I love it. I do also like the idea that in that factory, that magazine was just like an old playboy that they were all reading because that's all they had and they were like yeah look at that. oh my god there's a story about a murderer because <laughs> playboy does have very interesting articles they were showing it around to all their colleagues going have you seen this yeah mate yeah oh wait it's a murderer it? oh my god look at this Jeff. yeah oh god no it's, it's a murderer you read a lot of playboy yeah. then i'm taking it <laughs> <laughs> i don't i just read it for the articles and also timing for him bloody hell oh god yeah it couldn't have been worse i mean he, I mean, yeah. he could have lived happily ever after if it wasn't for that pesky we, we war. hope he didn't <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing between this time and this time i just it wasn't for that honestly <laughs> it's fine i'm not a nazi i'm not a spy i'm not, I'm we, not there a... wouldn't have been nazis either because we're talking first world war um, oh yes first so, world war <laughs> <laughs> i'm not from the future <laughs> i'm not from the future oh what a great story thanks for that nick well what do you think people do you think that frederick moores is still out there somewhere or in his discover the secret of longevity <laughs> yeah. or do you think that was his body do you think that he could have escaped do you think that you're going to make a sucker punch because it's damn delicious yeah probably should so the recipe i i decided i will let the recipe go so uh, make one and um, the rest will be out this evening i give it a go it's surprisingly lovely absolutely delicious a nick gordon original <laughs> i will forgive the fact that that was fucking tenuous that was a very tenuous <laughs> vienna here's a Never tort <laughs> i'm sure there could have been other things in there but still okay but, but i'm happy because the result was good could have been chloroform someday someday <laughs> we haven't had that as an ingredient yet not yet and hopefully not so try a sucker punch get the ingredients together see what happens tell us your theories about the story share more stories with us ideas of stories that you would like us to cover if you haven't already discovered patreon now's the time to head over there check out Definitely. all of our delicious lovely stories and extra stories and blooper reels and crazy stuff that we're going to put out before all christmas all sorts of madness mm. and also we're coming up to christmas so should you want to get someone a little poisoner's cabinet themed gift our merch <laughs> store is open who wouldn't want that for christmas who wouldn't get your granny a nice poisonous cabinet hoodie. sticker or a hoodie <laughs> Absolutely. She can be gangster. Everyone with their Christmas eggnog in a poisonous cabinet mug. Oh, yeah. That's what you want. And thank you to Lolly and to people who have been sharing pictures of you wearing the merch on Instagram. Yes. Love it. If Marvelous. you do order anything, share pictures with us. We love to see it. And if you can, please leave us a review on Apple iTunes. If you leave a review, please send it to us so we know it's happened and we can share the love back to you because you don't always see them. But share reviews, tell your friends and download and subscribe to all of our episodes. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.